Welcome to a conversation with His Excellency Sonam P. Wangdi of the Kingdom of Bhutan, the chair of the least developed country group of negotiators in the UNFCCC, and the Right Honourable Anne-Marie Trevelyan, the UK champion for adaptation and resilience for the COP26 presidency. Now we'll start perhaps with a question for Ms. Trevelyan. You have been appointed in November in your champion role. There's a little under a year until the delayed COP26 in Glasgow. What do you hope to achieve in this year? Thank you, Mari. Well, it's a great opportunity I've been given to champion adaptation and resilience ahead of COP26, as you say, within, within the year now. And there is lots to do. Because by 2030, without climate action, more than 100 million people will be pushed into poverty by those climate change impacts with the worst effects felt by women and girls and those most marginalised groups. So my key aims is going to be really listening to the countries, find out what they're doing and what they need. I want to find ways to support countries to prioritise adaptation action and so that collectively we don't miss this opportunity to build our global resilience and adapt to those impacts of climate shocks. And I also want to ensure that by COP26, this is a truly shared problem and that together we are finding solutions to be more resilient and adapt as we need to so that we can all thrive in an inclusive and a sustainable way. Thank you. His Excellency Sonam Wangdi, you're from the Kingdom of Bhutan, which already has a net zero carbon footprint. It's not creating any net emissions. With other least developed countries, you have been consistently outspoken on the need for more ambitious international climate action. When it comes to the adaptation and resilience agenda, what are your priorities for COP26? Thank, thank you. <clears throat> Bhutan is, uh, in fact, uh, carbon negative by leaps and bounds. And uh, so are in terms of uh, the, uh, the, uh, the uh, vision to be uh, more carbon neutral. The other LDCs, they have been also working very hard uh, uh, in terms of uh, adapting to climate change. Uh, as you all know that uh, they in fact uh, are in fact they contribute the least all of us together at least but uh, we disproportionately suffer the impacts of climate change it is uh, a reality today and every day we are suffering from climate change therefore our priority is uh, to in fact improve our abilities uh, to uh, adapt to climate change and to build uh, resilience uh, to the shocks mm -hmm. so as to be able to reduce both in terms of the cost and uh, in terms of uh, the loss and damage it inflicts uh, on the population. <clears throat> We've, in fact, the LDC group, uh, we have always, uh, our position has been that uh, this adaptation has to be addressed uh, in balance with mitigation. Currently, there is uh, a much bigger uh, move towards mitigation in terms of the funding. So ours is for more balance and our needs are financial, technological capacity building, both in uh, planning, developing, implementing our adaptation plans and ad other adaptation uh, actions. Uh, in terms of COP26, uh, we, we in fact uh, would like all the adaptation related institutional arrangements such as the Adaptation Committee, Least Developed Countries Expert Group, the Nairobi Work Program, and the Standing Committee on Finance. Uh, they have their mandates, and in accordance with that, to, in fact, uh, facilitate greater knowledge sharing, strengthen technical capacities, uh, in terms of also uh, identify best uh, available technologies and uh, ensure that these experiences are shared. And, of course, even... Monitoring evaluation is very important uh, to track uh, <clears throat> the progress of adaptation efforts uh, and uh, overall to support planning and implementation of adaptation priorities and needs of our countries. Also, we have this LDC group, which uh, I mentioned earlier, LDC expert group. This needs to be strengthened during the review that's going to be taking place. And we want to ensure 
that uh, this group is there, uh, that the support from this group is guaranteed for the LDCs. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. That's a very big and ambitious agenda, but also a very clear and granular agenda for action. So we thank you for that specificity. You've mentioned many bodies and instruments of the UNFCCC process, which sound complex, but in fact are very much needed and need to be strengthened to achieve adaptation on the ground. Ms. Trevelyan, cast yourself forward a year, if you will, to the end of COP26. What legacy would you like to leave for the COP27 presidency, which essentially <coughs> will be an African one? Absolutely. And we know that the scale of climate risks and impacts on countries across the world uh, are increasing and they're just going to keep doing that uh, through this year and on. So there is a window right now to drive a clean and inclusive and a resilient recovery from COVID, making sure that we avoid locking in maladaptation to climate change for years to come and instead to secure long term resilience through really focused and effective adaptation. We hadn't expected to have that challenge, but it does afford an opportunity to think differently. So through the UK's presidency and in my particular role, I really hope to pass on a legacy of strong political commitments and real action on adaptation and resilience that will give the African presidency a solid and sustainable foundation on which to continue in this space and at pace because climate shocks are going to keep coming. So a legacy that firmly puts adaptation and resilience at the heart of climate action for many, many years to come and make sure that those most marginalized groups become absolutely mainstream in their part, women and girls, indigenous people in developing and delivering those adaptations that are needed. Thank you. His Excellency Sonam Wandi, we've heard a lot now about the commitment the UK COP26 presidency is bringing to adaptation and resilience and how Ms Trevelyan sees it playing out for her particular legacy. Tell us more about what's happening on the ground in LDCs. What are some of the things they're doing to make adaptation happen, to make communities more climate resilient? The LDCs... Uh are on the front line uh, in terms of uh, to, uh, to enhance uh, action for adaptation and resilience. Uh, last year at the UN Secretary General Summit, uh, we uh, launched our 2050 vision. Uh, that vision states that uh, the LDCs will be on climate resilient pathways by 2030 and uh, net zero by 2050 to ensure that our ecosystems and our societies thrive. So, so that, that, uh, that, is, that is the vision that we have declared. And uh, to do that, we have a number of initiatives. We have, in fact, uh, three initiatives, uh, which uh, together will uh, assist in implementing this vision. We have what we call uh, the first, uh, the LDC Renewal Energy and Energy Efficiency Initiative for Sustainable Development which uh, provides a framework for driving transformative change across sectors to accelerate the transition to renewable energy and energy efficiency. Then we have what we call the LDC Initiative for Effective Adaptation and Resilience, what we call Life Year, which will see LDC articulate a long-term vision for a climate resilient future and help prioritize investments behind uh, this vision. We also have what we call the LDC uh, Universities Consortium on Climate Change. And here, this is basically in terms of capacity building to have the diverse capacities to help LDCs achieve our vision. Through this vision, we hope uh, to integrate adaptation, mitigation, and resilience into our development objectives, working across society to deliver this we also want to channel about 70% of the finance to the local levels by 2030 so that it reaches the most vulnerable communities. And above all, we, we want to invest in our own institutions 
and our cl climate capabilities. Um, you do touch in particular on the need for finance as an enabler for effective adaptation and resilience action. And I wonder, Ms. Trevelyan, what's the aims of uh, your champion role in the COP26 presidency as a whole may be for finance for adaptation? Yes, I think, you know, the economic case for investment in adaptation and resilience is clear and there are significant returns to be made, both obviously in saving lives, but also financially. Uh, and the Global Centre on Adaptation uh, fund returns of up to 10 to 1 on investments. So uh, we shouldn't be shy of, uh, you know, saying, as, as His Excellency says, that we need to shift the balance of finance across to ensure that adaptation is well invested in. So to meet those real needs of countries, we need to both increase the amount of adaptation finance, but also to make it more accessible and to make the systems work more efficiently. So we're going to be using our presidency to drive improvements across these challenges. And we have a really clear aim actually to work with national governments, donor partners and the private sector to improve access to but also the overall amount of financing for adaptation. So we're working with public financing institutions and donor countries to increase finance flows and explore how innovative development financing mechanisms can mobilise greater private investments into adaptation and resilience. At the Financing Commons Summit in November, the UK, the Netherlands and the Dutch development finance institutions committed to greater collaboration to accelerate investment in those local adaptation and resilience solutions. But we also support direct action on this, such as the Coalition for Climate Resilient Investment, the CCRI, which is a private sector-led initiative to encourage businesses and countries to commit to applying climate risk pricing tools to aid decision-making. So overall, we must not only increase the money available, but crucially, we must aspire to do more with what is available. His Excellency Sonam Wangdi, there are a richness of ideas there, a lot of ideas there. Do they resonate with you? Do you think this is going to do the job? Thank you. Uh, the LDC group, uh, we think that uh, the current uh, business as usual approaches are not working. Uh, nor are the cl uh, global climate responses ambitious enough. The uh, current responses, most of them are often short time, they're sectoral in nature and uh, appear to work in uh, silos. Mm. And we also know that most are externally driven, uh, top down and highly intermediated, very high cost, high transaction cost, and also fail to build mm. in-country institutional cap uh, capabilities, structures and system for the long term. What we need is uh, we need a whole of society response which breaks out of silos, that channel support to local level, reaching those communities that need it most with ambitious targets and objectives for support and for finance to reach the local levels. We need to, in fact, scale up uh, finance it, to assist the LDCs implement uh, our, uh, our commitments under the Convention and the Paris Agreement. In terms of uh, our needs are much uh, rather more than what uh, type of support that's available. Uh, we did an estimation and we found that uh, even in our old NDCs, our needs per annum are closer to 100 billion. USD 193 million is our need uh, currently. Uh, in the new NDCs would be much, much more and it would be about about $500 billion by 2050. Currently, uh, LDCs are receiving about 14% of uh, the climate finance. And out of that, uh, only uh, about 20, 21% is meant for adaptation. So we are actually getting very little. I think in terms of adaptation, probably uh, just uh, a little more than half a billion dollars per annum. Thank you. So you're saying that 93 billion per year post 2020 is what you think is actually needed for LDCs to adapt adequately? We more than 93 uh, billion. Our, 
our NDCs as it stands, the updated ones are going to be much more. As it stands, we did an assessment that is coming to about 93 billion. Mm -hmm. Thank you. His Excellency, I think you have a direct question for Ms. Trevelyan about her personal perspective on these issues. Please go ahead. Uh, thank you. Uh, I'd like to ask Her Excellency, uh, as a citizen from a developed country, uh, what do you think is the common perspective on climate change? I mean, the layman's perspective. And of course, uh, as a person from a developed country, how can also we solve the climate change problem? Thank you, Your Excellency. Well, I think, you know, the impacts of, of climate change, climate shocks are felt all around the world, you know, from Yorkshire, in, you know, just around the corner from where I live in, in England, uh, across to some of the most uh, challenged small island states. But we are all custodians of our planet. Um, so we all have a responsibility to ensure that we protect and preserve the precious ecosystems that support lives and livelihoods, both here at home with me, there at home with you, uh, and everywhere else in between. I think not everyone sees the size and the importance of the challenge still, um, but what I find so um, encouraging and motivating is that our young people understand it's their generation who are impacted most severely by uh, climate change, uh, the loss of our natural ecosystems, and the climate shocks that can destroy their communities. And they're demonstrating an incredible amount of shared passion across the globe. There are no silos between them. They understand uh, instinctively, I think, that this is an emergency that we all need to take hold of. So I think we, we those of us in, in positions of authority, are absolutely duty bound to keep driving home the message that we must act now. And importantly, that we must act together, as you say, not in silos. But I think for me, most importantly, we owe it to our children and our grandchildren because uh, we must ensure that we uh, stop stop the problem and protect for the future. I think from you know from where I'm sitting, uh, and you know the evidence is clear that the least developed countries are so often at the forefront of action on adaptation because the crisis is real and now. So, are there lessons that you would like to share with others? Um, to help us as we push for that greater global action. Uh, thank you, Excellency. Uh, I believe that having a platform, we, we are the LDC group, uh, we have this uh, forum, and uh, here we are able to achieve a common understanding uh, of uh, the problem of the climate crisis. And we are able also to uh, then formulate... Uh, responses, shared responses to combat uh, the, the impacts of climate change. Uh, so the LDCs, uh, through that mechanism, uh, we've been then doing our bit. Uh, we've been, in fact, uh, calling for uh, uh, greater ambition. We ourselves are committing, even through take, uh, borrowing. In fact, most of the climate finance coming to the LDCs are actually borrowing. 66% of that is borrowings. So we are updating our NDCs, we are implementing national adaptation plans, and we are trying to create that enabling political environment. Even during this COVID days, we are trying to find ways in how we, how we can, in fact, meet our targets. Mm -hmm. So we, we do more than our share, our fair share, to, uh, to ensure that uh, we are able to halt this crisis. Mm -hmm. But uh, as you know, this is a global problem. Uh, this is a global crisis and de and uh, demands a global response, an ambitious response. And uh, we believe that uh, cooperation is the only answer, solidarity and cooperation. And I'm confident that if we have that, we can ensure a sustainable, climate-resilient future that provides uh, a safer and better world for our ch children and for generations to come. But only if we work effectively and constructively constructively together in this shared endeavor. Your Excellency, thank you. Uh, those words are both uh, encouraging and motivating. I think we have much to do together and I'm really looking forward to be able to work with you, uh, with the LDC group uh, and across the globe to really drive forwards the absolute clear challenge that we must get our planet into a uh, 
resilient state and to be able to pass it on to our children uh, better than we found it. So thank you, and I look forward to working with you in the year ahead. Uh, thank, thank you, Excellency. Uh, the LDC group is also, as I uh, mentioned in the beginning, uh, counting uh, on your support. And uh, we are looking forward to working, working with you. And you can count on our support because adaptation and resilience is very dear and very close to our hearts. So you can count, always count on us. Thank you. Those were very motivating words to conclude today's conversation. Thank you so much then to His Excellency Sonam P. Wangdi, the Chair of the LDC Group of Negotiators, and to the Right Honourable Anne-Marie Trevelyan, the UK International Champion on Adaptation and Resilience for the COP26 Presidency. Viewers, thank you for watching. Please visit www.casaclimate.org for news and features on the climate change negotiations and carefully picked resources to support climate change negotiators. Goodbye.